as we'll be ordaining uh, Terry as a deacon here at the church, so keep that in mind. And then the uh, 24th to the 27th will be our youth revival here, that it'll begin that night. Uh, Josh Prescott from um, Daniel's Chapel will be with us, and uh, worship will be led by our youth, as well as some youth from uh, some youth bands. Uh, there's at least a couple other churches that have, that uh, Adam's talking to about incorporating some of their youth their youth bands into leading the worship as well. So kind of excited about that and looking forward to what God's going to be doing there. We do want to remind you it's youth and family revival. So yes, it'll be kind of uh, geared towards our youth, but we want our we want our adults to come and support our youth uh, with your with your presence. Your prayers are appreciated, but your presence is desired. Uh, you'd be amazed. Uh, how, what what it looks like to see those kids worshiping God, and uh, they they would be they'd be appreciative. They may not say it as much, but they'd be appreciative seeing the adults in the church uh, supporting them with with their attendance. So keep that in mind and make every effort to be here that you can. Uh, March twenty sixth is the senior fellowship trip to Rocky Hawk, and I believe uh, that Mr. Billy put an announcement on Facebook today about what time they'd be leaving. And I can't remember what time it said. So um, if you're on Facebook, check that, and I'll try to make sure that I get that time uh, to John so we can get put in the bulletin for uh, this coming Sunday. Also, uh, this Sunday, uh, we will be uh, getting out, or, or or technically we weren't, we're not supposed to give them out tonight, but uh, we're supposed to wait till Sunday. But tonight, your kids will start getting applications for CYC. Um, they are going to be due, and let me make sure I say all this right, because um, Adam wanted to make sure that I made the announcement and that I gave everybody the correct information. Um, April 14th will be the due date for CYC applications. He's going to be mailing them to Angela the very next day, so those applications are going to need to be turned in by April the 14th. Also, there uh, a $180 check. Uh, for each camper that will be going. Uh, if you need financial aid, then please see Adam as soon as possible. Um, it, we want to make sure that all the kids that want to go can go. Uh, I do know that, that Angela said she's expecting camp to, uh, to be full this year and to fill up fast. And so we're going to have to make sure we get our stuff in uh, as soon as we can. So uh, it's... You, your child, if they're in, if they're in worship with Adam tonight, will get one of those uh, applications. Uh, if they didn't, and you would like for your child or grandchild or uh, niece or nephew to go, then make sure that that uh, you get an application, get it filled out, and uh, along with the hundred eighty dollars to to uh, go towards it, and then uh, we'll be raising the money for the rest. There are other announcements that, I, that you'll find there in the bulletin. I'll encourage you to read those. There is one that's not in the bulletin that i uh, kind of been working on today. And um, I kind of mentioned this to Miss Bev in a Facebook message. But we've added one more song, Miss Bev. Uh, we're also going to add Bless Be the Tie to it. Um, but we're going to be working for the Maundy Thursday service that we're, that we're going to be hosting, the kind of the community service. We're going to be putting together a community choir. And so what we would like is we're going to be singing uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and um, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. So if you'd like to be a part of it um, or if you know somebody out in the community you think that would, that would like to be a part of it, uh, hopefully by this weekend we'll have a couple dates that we'll be able to get together and practice and then uh, it'll be, uh, that'll all be part of our Monday Thursday service. Are there any other announcements that need to be made tonight that I have not mentioned? Yes. All right. Any other announcements? Okay. All right. 
Any others? All right, if there are no others, we are going to continue in our service, and we're going to sing. And uh, so if you will uh, turn in your hymnals to hymn number 327, the old rugged cross, we're going to stand and sing the first and last verses of this hymn. God in prayer and as we do we'd like to know what items of praise or items of concern we have tonight amen amen also thank for some halfway decent weather the last few days didn't have to swim into the church Any other items of praise or concern? Amen. Well, let's definitely remember that. I know there are many there are many people in our church that have spoken and unspoken requests that are I uh, deal with very various parts of our lives so let's remember remember those requests that we may all be struggling with but you know it's a, a private issue mm. well, let's definitely remember that Yes. I'll also request prayer for Elizabeth's sister. As many of you know, a couple weeks ago she had surgery to uh, remove her gallbladder. Well, uh, every everyone in her family, uh, her husband and her two children, last week had the norovirus. Well, guess who has it this week? And it's Christy. So, um, so now she gets to share in the joy that is that virus. So, um, just a. Uh, say a prayer for her and that this will get completely out of their home and uh, they can uh, get back to what normal is supposed to look like. Yes. 
Yes. Amen. Okay. Betty Chesson, let's remember that. Okay. Any others? Let's definitely remember that. Oh, Lord of mercy. Ah. Really? Oh, well, well, praise God. I'm not sure. I know Kay would know. I think it was somebody that whose aunt works with with Kay. So. Are, are there any others? Oh my goodness! I thought baseball was supposed to be a non-contact sport, and softball too. Yes, let's definitely pray for safety for them. And let's definitely remember them. I'll also say I requested prayer for my brother this past week that uh, he had to get a certain time on his run for his PT test uh, with the National Guard to get his promotion, and he did pass his physical fitness test, so um, he should receive his sergeant stripes soon. So, um... Just uh, say a prayer for for him and those poor guys are going to be underneath him now. So. Yeah. Well, we'll praise God and also continue to pray. Any others? All right, if there are no others, I'm going to ask Mike, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer tonight? Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. Uh, when I read, I'll be reading uh, John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. And and uh, you may have noticed the last little bit, we've, we haven't had things up on the screen. Well, uh, to put things mildly, we've had some technical difficulties. And so um, I will say be, be praying that these technical difficulties stop being so difficult. Because uh, um, I know it's frustrating to those guys upstairs, and uh, so so I just uh, say a prayer that that whatever's going on will be fixed, and um, we'll be able to to get back to uh, to having some of the those things, those I guess uh, luxuries that we don't think about until we're not able to use them. So. Um, John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27 is where I'll be coming from. So as I begin tonight, I want to take us back to about 2,000 years ago. And I want you to, to kind of picture who I'm talking about. A young teenage woman going about her business when a messenger from God comes to her and tells her that she was favored 
amongst all women. You kind of you, you kind of know who I'm already kind of talking about. She had been chosen by God to be the one that would conceive and give birth to the Messiah, whose name would be Jesus. This path would not be an easy one. She was going to have to deal with the stigma that, that was going to come with all of this. Remember, she and Joseph were engaged. They were betrothed, but they were not married. And so now they were going to have a speedy wedding, which for many people probably thought, that probably led them to make several assumptions about what was going on there. But what she understood was that this was going to be the greatest gift to the world. Also understand, this was going to be a big deal. I remember when, my, when I told my parents, uh, well, actually my parents found out when the rest of the church did, that I had accepted the call to preach. Well, for about the next two months, my daddy was afraid to spank me because he read in Scripture where it said, Touch not mine anointed. And I took advantage of that, y'all. And so here I was, 10-year-old Dale Belvin, saying, My daddy ain't going to whoop me. Well, my daddy talked to the preacher. The preacher said it was okay to whoop me, and that ended really quickly. But you can ask my parents, raising a, a young preacher for them was like, oh my, it was already a big responsibility raising a child. Then you added the fact that, you know, that I'd accepted the call to preach. My parents were like, oh my goodness, you know, we have a tremendous amount of responsibility. Well, imagine being tasked with raising the Messiah with being the one who, who was supposed to make sure that the Messiah was physically taken care of. Yeah. <laughs> you doing what now? <laughs> but, you know, can you imagine all that? The difficulty level. And for, you know, somebody that Mary, at the youngest, could have been as young as 13, but probably no, no older than... 16 or 17 years old. Can you imagine a 16 or 17 year old raising the Messiah? But all of this, she said, and I love that passage at the end of, at the end of Luke, or in, at the end of that conversation as it's recorded in Luke, where she says, may it be to me as you have said. Her complete surrender to God's will. Well, as her son grew older, her job as a mother changed. She went from being the provider to being the one provided for. She became the concerned parent waiting to see her son do everything that God had called him to do. She became one of the greatest ministry supporters in the world. In the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, Mary experienced quite the roller coaster. Now, scriptures don't tell us exactly when she joined Jesus in Jerusalem. But if she wasn't there, I'm sure that she at least heard about the way that Jesus was welcomed in Jerusalem on that day that we now celebrate as Palm Sunday. And, and, and we'll celebrate that in a few weeks as they cut off palm branches from off, of, from off the trees and began to wave the palm branches. And they laid out their cloaks on the street as Jesus rode a donkey, made a royal entrance into Jerusalem. And all of those people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine what was going through Mary's mind? Even if she wasn't there and she hears people recount what happened. You got to think a moment of pride. Hang upon her, that's my son. He's, this is the one that I carried for nine months. The one that I rocked to sleep. The one that I saw become this man. I'm sure she also heard what Jesus did less than 24 hours later when he walks into the temple and ticks off all of the religious leaders by molding, by, by, by making a whip and then chasing them all around with the whip, turning over the tables and fussing them all out. I imagine she's sitting there going, what, what's going on? And she was likely one of those who helped make preparations for Jesus to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. Many scholars believe that by the, you know, he would have had his, not just his friends, but his family there, and his family would have been the ones in the background making the Passover meal. 
In all likelihood, she was there in the crowd when Jesus was interrogated, tortured, and condemned to death. And we know from Scripture that she was at the foot of the cross while Jesus was crucified. I can't imagine what this was like for Mary. Mary was so instrumental in Jesus' life. And now she's standing at the foot of the cross watching as her son, the Messiah, suffers the pain and agony of the cross. This is the backdrop for our text tonight. Let's read John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. May God add his blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy word, and let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are here in this place tonight. We thank you that you inspired these words. These, these words were God-breathed into, into existence. And so, God, I pray that as we dig into these words, God, that we would find the truths that you intend for us to hear tonight. I pray that, that we would give you our, our most attentiveness, attentiveness now, God. God, that we would we'd put all the distractions to the side and get focused on you. God, give me the words that we stand in need of. And God, give me the boldness and confidence to say them nothing more, nothing less than that which is in your perfect and holy will. I got this in all prayers we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. So here in this passage, Jesus sees really four friendly faces amongst the, wife, amongst the mob. There is Mary, the wife of Clopas. He sees his, Mary, or he sees his mother, Mary. And just to complete the trio, the trinity of Marys, I guess you could say, there's Mary Magdalene. And then you get his closest disciple, or as, or as John refers to himself as, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this was John. Now Mary of Clopas was likely, Mary, Jesus' mother, was likely her sister-in-law. Church tradition says that by the time that Jesus was, Jesus' ministry had began, that more than likely Joseph had died. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, the, the life expectancy of a Jewish male during that time wasn't much over 30 years old. And a Jewish female, it wasn't much more than that either. And in fact, with the lack of medicines and so forth, a lot of Jewish females died in childbirth. So the the likelihood of living to an old age in that time was very slim. And so what most scholars believe is that Joseph died and that it seems that Joseph's brother, Clopas, took Mary into his own home and took care of her. And so while, while they were there, Mar the two Marys probably became very close friends, not just related by marriage, but, but related by, by, by being with each other all the time. And so what we know is at the very least, Mary, the, the wife of Clopas, was there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the foot of the cross. Now, we've all, we all know that Mary Magdalene, there's a lot of uh, theories on who she was. Some say that she was the, the adulterous woman that was thrown at the feet of Jesus. And, you know, Jesus tells her, you know, kneels down and writes in the sand and all of her accusers leave. You remember that story? Well, you know, some people say that, that, that Mary Magdalene was that woman. There, there's nothing in Scripture that specifically outlines that. But at the very least, she's somebody who had become very devoted to Christ, enough so that she quite literally physically followed Jesus Christ. And then John. He was the only disciple with the courage to show his face at the cross. Can you think about that? Twelve men who spent their entire life the entirety of three years with Jesus or the majority of three years with Jesus. One of them completely turns his back on him, turns him in for 30 pieces of silver. What a nice guy there. 
another one who stands before Jesus just a few hours before and says, I would never deny you. Even if I have to die on a cross beside of you, I will never deny you. And what happens? Not only does not he doesn't just deny him, he denies him three times. And the last time he does it with some gusto. He calls out a curse upon himself, saying, if I know the man, may God curse me and may I die, is basically what Peter said. And so that's two of them right there. The rest of them ran away like, like little babies. And what we find is there's one that follows him to Calvary, and it's John. He stood there in support of Jesus and what he stood for. So Jesus looks at Mary, his mother, and looks at John, his closest disciple, and then he tells Mary, behold your son. And he does likewise, telling John to behold his mother. From the cross, Jesus was providing for two of the people in this world that were the closest to him. From the cross, he was concerned for somebody else's needs. From the cross, he was saying, I gotta make sure my mama's taken care of. From the cross, I've gotta make sure that my best friend is okay. Y'all, that's powerful. That in the midst of the agonizing and torturing death of the cross, here's Jesus looking out for the needs of others. And I also think not only was he taking care of some some stuff then I think he was also trying to teach us some important lessons even from the cross so there's three lessons in particular I want to point out tonight there's more but there's just three that I want to point out that we see here uh, from this phrase where Jesus where Jesus looks to Mary and tells him here's your son now and looks to John and says here's your mother now One of the most obvious things that's happening here is Jesus making sure that his mother was taken care of. As the eldest son, and Jesus obviously was the eldest son, it was his job, it was his responsibility to make sure that Mary was taken care of. Standing in front of him, he sees two of the most important people on earth to him. He sees his mother. Now this was a woman who had sacrificed a great deal. Remember in that introduction I talked about all the things that she went through and even some of the stuff that she would have had to she would have had to deal with on the fact of being the messiah who was conceived by the holy spirit and and trying to tell that story to people you know and we even talked about this when we talked about the apostles creed imagine somebody come up to you and you know if your child came up to you and said hey i'm pregnant and i was conceived by the holy spirit you'd probably have them committed to a mental hospital at the very least, you would say, quit lying to me, tell me the truth. And so you, you can imagine the type of responses that Mary got, the sacrifices that it took, not just then, but then taking care, raising a child. You know, um, in just the short little while that, that, Elizabeth, that Elizabeth and I have been fostering, what we've realized is there's a lot of sacrifice that takes place in raising a child. I didn't realize it till I had a couple that I've, and, and we've only been doing it for a few months. My mom and daddy are still raising me. Now, they may not, I may not be living at home, and they may not be footing the bill for all my food and for keeping a roof over my head, but my mom and daddy still have a significant amount of impact on me. And so even to that day, you can't tell me that Mary still didn't have a significant amount of influence. This was the woman who had watched him grow up, helped provide for his needs, and gave him an earthly family. This is a woman that had to be willing to let her son go. Man, let him go to be the healer. Let him go to be the teacher. Let him go to be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. This woman loved Jesus, and I think it's very clear that Jesus loved her. But Jesus also sees John, and and John was the youngest of the disciples, and it's likely that Jesus had almost a brother-type relationship with John, a big brother, little brother-type relationship. John, along with his brother James and Peter, were Jesus' closest confidants. And John shows his love for Jesus by being there in this dark moment. And John loved Jesus, and it's very clear that Jesus loved John. And in this moment, Jesus wanted to make sure that the mother that he loved would be taken care of. 
and he couldn't think of a better person to ask than John. From Scripture, it can be assumed that John did exactly as Jesus asked because there in that last verse, it says, from that moment forward, John took her in to his home. You see, even on the cross, Jesus was honoring one of the, one of the first ten commandments in Scripture. It is the only commandment that, that doesn't have a not in it. It's one of the affirmative commandments. It says, honor your father and mother. From the cross, he was honoring his father, or he was honoring his mother. And, this, and basically what this meant, especially in Jewish society, was to make sure they were taken care of. Honoring our parents now is something that we should take seriously as well. As children, this seems easy. You know, I remember being taught the Ten Commandments when I was a child, and I remember my Sunday school teacher talking about what to honor our mother meant what. You know, as a child, what, what, what was basically the, the idea of honoring your parents? Do what they told you to do. If your mom and daddy told you to clean your room, clean your room. If your mom and daddy told you not to do something, don't do it. If your mom and daddy told you to do something, then do it. That was the extent of honoring your father and your mother. Now, when I got older, I was taught that that meant being respectful to them, that that meant to, like, I'm a Belvin. And so I, I should do things remembering that Belvin is my last name, and my actions don't just reflect on me. They reflect on my parents. Now, my parents drilled that into me when I got into middle school and high school so that I was scared to death to do anything wrong because I didn't want to, I didn't want, well, the Belvins would have found out. And it wouldn't just have been my mom and daddy, it had been the rest of the Belvins in the community. And so it wouldn't have just been my mom and daddy that would have been sitting there going, it would have been my aunts and my uncles too. But what we understand is, at least in this aspect, there's so much to it. But this also means, especially as they get older and we get older, and we see, we see this especially in our world today, the roles begin to change a little bit. Where, you know, whenever you were younger, it was your parents taking care of you. As we get older, I believe one of the ways we show that our, we, we, we honor our parents is by being willing to do what we can to take care of them. And that's a big responsibility. But I believe it's, I believe as much as they sacrificed for us, that, that we, if we can, should be able to do the same thing. See, Jesus modeled this while he was on the cross. He modeled honoring his mother. If Jesus can do it while on the cross, I think we can do it while working or while doing our normal everyday activities. So there's the first lesson that we see here. And it's the most obvious lesson, the lesson of honoring our parents. There's another lesson I want us to see here. In this passage, many have seen this episode of John agreeing to take care of Mary to show us, basically it shows us how our bonds in the body of Christ transcend our family connections. John and Mary had no blood connection at all. They were not related in one tiny little bit. Mary, most of her family was, was from Nazareth. John was, in all likelihood, his family was, on one of those, was in one of those uh, towns that bordered the Sea of Galilee. Their families probably had never spoken to each other, probably had nothing to do with each other. But John took this calling from Jesus seriously. See, church tradition says that John built a home for Mary and took care of Jesus or took, Mary, took care of her needs just as Jesus asked him to. And this was the way that John could serve Jesus. As disciples of Jesus, we're called to care for each other, whatever the need may be, whatever the need may look like. And that, that our closeness as, a bro, as brothers and sisters in Christ extends even closer than what, than what family should be. Because y'all, we are a family. The scripture says we've been adopted into the family of God. One of the things that, um, that sticks out to me from that is, you know, um, and my, my mom and dad pick around, have picked around with me on this before, uh, you know, and said, said uh, we, we were talking about biological children versus adopted children. And she said, she said, with adopted children, you get to choose your children. She said, we didn't get to choose which one of y'all we got stuck with. Now, they were joking when they said that. My mama loves me more than likely. Um, but, you know, uh, 
in, in, all, in all honesty, with adoption, that's exactly what it is. You say, I want you to be my child. I want to extend to you all the privileges of being a part of the family. And that, to me, what that does, though, is that that binds us in a way that, that even a biological connection can't. Because God has chosen to make us part of his family. There's a song that I remember singing as a child. And we have the, the chorus of the hymn, or they have the chorus of it in our hymn book. But I love the verses to this song. Uh, it's hymn number 219, and I encourage you to turn there. It's entitled, The Family of God. I want to share the verses and chorus with you. And, and, so, and, and then I want you to sing the chorus with me when we get to the chorus. The first verse says, you will notice we, we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. It's not it. Well, I know, I know the chorus is in there. 419. Then the second verse says, from the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing from rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. And then the chorus, sing the chorus with me. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Y'all, we are part of the family of God. And it goes beyond any, any other bond we could possibly have. It goes beyond the flaws. And I, I love that, 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 that last part of the second verse. And I wish I had the verses in front of me. But it says, I'm not worthy to be here. In other words, I'm not worthy to be a part of the family of God. But praise God, I belong. And with that, we should, be in, we should be encouraged and challenged to, to do the best we can to be the best part of the fam, family that we can. It also means that when we see one of our brothers or sisters in need, you know, like, for instance, I would do anything I could. I'm not close enough to my brothers that if they have every little need they've got, that, that, I, that I would go, you know, that I would be there to help. But if I was, if I was right around the corner and they said, Dale, I need, I need your help, I'd do my best to be there. Well, I'd like to think, I'd like to hope that if I had a need, I could call one of my brothers and sisters in here and that one of you guys would say, yeah, what do you need? And I'd like to think that you know you could do the same thing with me or the same thing with the person sitting to your right or to your left or in front, or behind you. I see Curtis over there, Tabby Carey on the shoulder. And she said, no, she wouldn't. <laughs> well, but, you know, I just, just as John was willing to, to take on the responsibility of taking care of someone that was not blood related, he saw that this was something that he could do to serve Jesus. We could and should do the same thing. Take on the responsibility of caring for someone because they're our brother or sister in Christ. There's one other aspect here, and I had never really thought about this part until I was doing this preparation and I was reading the book that all this is based on. And uh, just so you know, the, the book that all this is based on is an Adam Hamilton book called Final Words from the Cross. And, and so what we see here is that we're not just taught about honoring our parents, and we're not just taught about an example of what the church should look like. But what we also see here is a model for those who have suffered loss. Think about this. Mary suffered great loss here. 
Mary lost her son to to the tragic death of the cross. Now, I can't imagine being a parent and losing a child. I imagine that that it could be enough to to paralyze a person, to, to emotionally and mentally paralyze a person. No one would blame someone if they shut down at that moment, at least for a little while. And Mary lost her son not once but twice because she lost him to death. And then just a few days later, he ascends into heaven. And, he, and just, you know, can you imagine the roller coaster there? He dies on the cross, the most brutal and agonizing death, and she was there for every minute of it. Then he comes back, to, he, comes, he rises from the grave on Sunday, three days later, and she's like, oh my goodness, my son is alive. He's here again. Isn't this great? And then a few days later, he's ascending into heaven and, and she's like mourning a loss now a second time. You know, Mary lost her son and she lost him to the death and she lost him to the ascension. Shutting down though is not what Mary did. Mary continued on, and we should too. Mary had John and the rest of her church family. She had the early church. Most importantly, Mary had her faith. When we, all, we all go through times of great loss in our lives. Losses of relationships. Losses of jobs. Losses of financial stability. Losses of someone close to us. And these can be tough times. And you know what? God understands that. In fact, Hebrews talks about that we don't have a high priest that don't understand because he's experienced it all. He's experienced loss. You know, he had one of his closest friends deny him. He had another one of his closest closest friends betray him. He's experienced loss. He's experienced all the pains that that we could possibly experience. And I'll say this, God wants us to grieve. Grief is healthy. Grief is something that we should do. Because if we don't, there, there's all kinds of other like psychologically proven things that if you, don't help, if you don't find a healthy way to grieve, it creates some problems that can, that can last for years. But what God doesn't want us to do is get stuck in the grief to get stuck in those moments and allow those moments to define us. Our grief over our loss, whatever that loss is, couldn't and, or, or shouldn't as Christians define who we are because we don't find our identity in the things that happen of this world. We find our identity in God. God, God is the one that when, when we, lo- we can lose anything and everything in this world. I think of Job for an example. Job lost everything, y'all. He lost his family like his children, he lost his possessions, he lost his health, and for all intents and purposes, he lost his wife. Because his wife says, Joe, why don't you just curse God and die? And then, as if you couldn't pile any more on top of it, his friends come and spend the next God knows how many chapters in the book of Job saying, what'd you do wrong? What'd you do wrong? Over and over and over and over and over again. One, one says it, and Job says, would you hush and leave me alone? And then the next one says it. It's like they volley back and forth on how they can attack Job. That what they, honestly, there's a part of me that thinks they were looking to find the gossip. They can go out and say, oh, you won't believe what Job did. Can you imagine they had Facebook back then? Thank God it's broke down tonight. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, Job lost everything. And, and he even had some, he had some moments where he kind of, we'll just say fussed with God. But even if you read there, God had every right to say, Job, who do you think you are? Pow, you're dead right now. But that's not what God did. God kind of reminded Job who was in charge and who wasn't. But Job got through it. And he came out on the other side, a blessed man. And when I say blessed, I don't, the Bible does say that he came out with more possessions and he had more in the end than he did at the beginning, but I don't think that's what makes him blessed. I don't think physical possessions is what, is what blessing is. I think, and I shared, I shared this terminology and I saw it on Facebook and it stuck out to me. Facebook can be a negative thing, but it could also be a good thing. I was, you know, grace is 
not or gra- or grace is receiving good when we don't deserve it and mercy is not receiving the bad when we deserve it and blessings is mercy and grace you, you, you get what i'm saying that's what blessing is blessing is that god has given us grace and has given us mercy he did it for job he does it for us if we'll keep that in mind and it doesn't matter what we lose in this world because Jesus says, lay up your treasures in heaven, not in things of this world. And so, yeah, loss can be tough. But if we can do our best to try to remember what our number one priority should be, then God will help us, God will help us get through that loss. So my final words for tonight. Tonight's phrase was not the most powerful. How many of you have, have, have spent much time reading this, passage, this portion of the passage of Scripture about, from the crucifixion? I mean, I, I, there's a few of us, but most of us in here, this was not the most familiar phrase from the cross. Most of us in here would probably say, it is finished, or maybe I thirst, or, you know, uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those are words that we're all a little more familiar with. But I'll tell you, for this to be one of the more unfamiliar phrases of Jesus on the cross, it's a, man, it's a, it's a portion that has some power, that has some deep meaning to it. As we close tonight, we're gonna do, I'm going to do something similar to what, what I did this past Sunday night. I want to share with you a song. And um, it's another one that uh, kind of takes our mind to the cross and the significance of the cross and it takes the words of a hymn and adds a chorus to it and so the the title of this song is the wonderful cross and kind of an older an older praise and worship song but um but just uh, listen to the words
go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the wonderful cross. And God, we thank you that, that it calls us to come and, and sacrifice ourselves, but understand that when we make a sacrifice to you, that God, you take it and you can make even the most lowly of sacrifice, you can, you can make it into something beautiful. God, we find that when we, when we sacrifice to you we find the true meaning in living god we thank you that that you have called us all to that and god i pray that we would surrender to that call i pray god that that we would that we would keep in mind the lessons that we learn in scripture and specifically the ones that we've seen tonight i pray god that we would remember that no matter how old we are no matter our station in life, what's going on, that, that your commandments, in especially, especially in regards of honoring our parents, apply no matter, no matter our stage in life. God, I pray that we would also take our responsibility and our privilege of being a part of the body of Christ, a part of your church, seriously, God. And God, that we would we'd take care of our brothers and sisters. God, that we, would have, that we would look for ways to meet those needs and that we would be closer than even a brother, God. And God, I pray that, that God, you would help us whenever we suffer losses. And, and God, because we live in a world that is, that is dealing with the results of sin, loss is a part of our lives. And God, we experience many different kinds of losses, but God, we don't have to get stuck in the losses. God, if we can, if we'll remember that, that we have our all in you, then it doesn't matter what we lose here on this earth because we'll always have you. I pray, God, that, that, that God will show you our love, will show you our, our trust and our faith in you in all that we do. Oh, God, I thank you for being here in this place tonight. I thank you for each one that, that is here tonight. Bless them for their time here. And God, may all of us make a serious effort to lead, to lead a life that is worthy of the title Christian. Now God, be with us as we leave this place. Give us safe trips to our homes. Give us a good second half of the week and bring us back on Sunday. Once again, ready to worship you to fellowship with each other, to learn to learn more about you, our relations or to learn you, learn more about you, learn more about our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and the relationship that you long to have with us as well. Now God, this and all prayers we ask in the precious and only name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all of God's children said, Amen. Now I'll just say this uh, if you don't see me out here in the gallery, I got to run something off for Jerry, but I'll be right back out there in the gallery as soon as I can. <laughs> oh, thank you.